because you know St. Paisios, everyone was you know kind of bringing him up last time, but you know St. Paisios, it's like I'll tell you a story about St. Paisios. There's these uh, young men who came to him, and they were you know to be frank, insincere, disingenuous, and you know they came and they said, hey, you know um, you're you're a monk, right? Like can you know get us some water you know hospitality or get us some water so St. Paisius gets them some water you know they drink it whatever they said oh you know we want more water right he goes and gets them some more water and they ask for a third time and then he comes and he pours the water out on the ground in front of them and they're like oh that's not Christian you're not a Christian you're not a monk you're like that's not loving whatever he says I did it the first time to show that I have no problem submitting my will to yours but the third time I won't, I won't, um, you know, I won't foster your laziness. Yeah. Okay. Hello and welcome to Royal Path. I'm your host, Andrew. Tonight, I'm going to ask Cyprian and Father, what is a book or whatever movie, some story that you guys just like that really biffed the ending? Mm. I got mine. I'll give you guys a second. Mine is of Battlestar Galactica, Mm. the rebooted one (laughs) from 2008, I think, or whatever. It was really really great up until like the and i it's not the worst ending but it's kind of like it just seemed like the complete ran out of steam and just like and that's even like what the actors felt like they were or like the characters like ah good enough we got we got somewhere so uh it was a great show and i really love it i actually have a whole tattoo right here because of Battlestar galactica i it's probably one of my favorite shows of all time but the ending kind of stunk a little bit so, what about you, Cyprian? Mm. It's a tough. One. Well, it's we were talking question. about we were talking about the show that I was that I was a star of, and I think that that one, for a lot of reasons, did basically the same thing. But unfortunately, that lack of closure led my co-stars into some very very dark places. You know what I mean? And myself. Luckily, I found Christ. They didn't, but. I would say I would say of all the considering I was a big uh, a big part of that one of the one the one uh story or show or whatever that blew the ending and had a huge impact on my life was probably the one that I was involved in so but it turns out it wasn't the ending for me right mm-hmm. it still isn't so man oh boy um I can't remember which one it was. I, I have a couple. Um, and I don't know if it counts because I know they kind of restarted it, but I didn't watch it. Um, but it was Young Justice. Oh, yeah. It's just leave it where it was. That's okay. Yeah. You don't need to do three and four. That's yeah. okay. Yeah. yeah. Young Justice is good, though. Young Justice is good. Yeah. It's a really good show. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's not a, uh, the... Uh... Yeah, bringing something back. When you bring something back, I think that's the real. That's the real thing. Is like what shouldn't have had a sequel. And I'm like Arrested the Matrix. Development. Arrested the development. Matrix. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's yeah. like when you bring these things back. The crazy thing is that, like, when you bring something back after there has been closure, right? So, like I was saying, but like this closure is like really important. And the thing is, it's not just important to the audience, like you said, right? And like I and like I echoed, it's imp- it's so important to the cast and the crew. And like one of the things that happened in the last season of the show that I was on, they went one season too long in this regard because the crew, the producers, everybody who had worked together that we all like 
became a family over five seasons to because they only got a smaller budget to be like, okay, we can eke out one last season. They didn't bring the producers back who would have given us been able to give us the closure fundamentally like the writers and everything. They didn't bring them back. And they had like this second tier group of, they basically like brought up people who were PAs to do it. And like, they all thought there was going to be a seventh season, but we were like, no, you're doing it all wrong. So there's no way we're going to get renewed for this thing. But it's like, it's so important for the people who have invested so much of their lives in telling a story that there is closure. Like it's, it, man, it's, it's crazy for me to think about this because it's like, you know, my co-stars, it's really actually sad, the lack of closure. Like one of my co-stars is doing 20 years. I've talked about this before is doing 20 years in Nevada state penitentiary for murdering a woman with his bare hands in the middle of a psych, some sort of psychedelic ceremony. Right. Another one is like a bombed out hippie guru who now calls himself Reverend Doctor because he got some like universal life church. He does Reiki now and all of this type of stuff. And he's got a little thing in Sedona. He's like fully new age. Right. And it's just like these, that lack of closure and that the, the disorientation that comes from a lack of closure, I've just like, I've had the visceral personal experience of how deadly and dangerous that can be. It's great. People don't like, oh, you whatever the audience back. thinks and the crit whatever the critics think and the audience thinks it's like you have no idea the psychological the the psychological struggle that these people who have created this thing are especially after like six seasons long many seasons like that's a lot of your life that was eight years of my life that was my whole 30s and it's like the audience has no clue of what these people have given of themselves to deliver them an entertaining product, mm -hmm. you know, and then they want to critique. Mm -hmm. It's like, it's incredible, but it's, but again, they can't know. I don't fault them for that because there's no way to know it except having been inside of it. You just, you can't imagine it. You can't have empathy for it, you know, but I mean, look what it does. To, that's why child stars go off the rails. Yeah. There's never any closure to those shows. And that's there's why they there's go no off closure the to their lives. That's right. There's no closure to their lives, you know, because it's supposed to be the beginning of their life, but it's the end of their career. And you but can't about, reconcile those two things. And I mean, I, I would just say. But I think there's something profoundly comforting in a sense. Now, I know what you're saying, Supreme, but at the same time, I mean, like, so I like comic books. Mm -hmm. And comic books is is you have to live in the second act. Are you cool hanging out in the second act for about a hundred years? Because you know the definitive. Well, when you say you, you're talking about the audience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, but those aren't. But the thing is, those aren't real people that have to live in the second act. No, I, I know. I'm not debating that. I'm not arguing that with yeah. you. What I'm saying is, is that uh, no, well, it's I mean, great for the audience. The audience loves I mean, it. I hate there's no the audience always group. wants more right they want it more and they want it more often there's more there's no if definitive proof that Batman isn't real that's all I'm going to say there is no definitive <laughs> proof I'm just saying I mean <laughs> I've never been to the east coast for all I know there is Gotham City over there but what I would say is that like I mean because I always found that comforting and I wonder if that's some kind of distortion of um seeking like a world without end you know what I mean like because like I it's like it's comforting to me to know that there is no third act for the story and sometimes that does drive me a little bit away from say a 12 issue series that takes place in a universe different my, than the main continuity or whatever and like say Batman or Peter Parker or someone dies it's like I'm never it's never going to stop me from reading that story in fact well he doesn't die but that's why I like the Dark Knight Returns as well because like there's no definitive ending but to those that there is like nope this character is dead definitively done end game like avengers end game end of this arc this is done and then that that always is like a little bit like kind of a bummer to me because uh well, keeping the there's there's a there's there's but man this is so 
I think this gets it's into a, a bigger thing, a, though, right? Because about this, consumer and producer, I think is what it gets into. I mean, it's yes, but I think even consumer and producer, those are just aspects of a bigger problem in regards of mm-hmm. wrong relation. Mm-hmm. You know, because everything when you begin to live a sacramental life, you begin to um, not just out of kind of like a um, you know, kind of dry piety of like, oh, I can't listen to this and I can't watch that and I can't do that. But just your taste for those things begins to wane because you're you're in the actual true story, the true narrative. Yeah. And yeah. that's why when someone loses there's there's those initial movements of losing the taste for entertainment. Again, th- those come from being, you know, kind of initiated into something and, and and that's good. That's fine. But there comes a time and it doesn't happen to someone like one year in it, it, it's, there comes a time when these things begin to, to lose their luster because of the reality of not that necessarily um, they're bad in of themselves, but because now, you've been, you know, feeding on the real thing. And so it's just the, the, the reality of what we look at narrative and story and all these things. And, and this is part of the problem of why <clears throat> deception is what it is, because, you know, the big thing of, um, you know, the kind of baby face heel thing, right. And the, the, this big play on, you know, it's easy to use that for with people because people are constantly wanting that. Oh, Father, can you dive you're into? Talking that? K- yeah. You're talking about kayfabe. You're talking about wrestling kayfabe. Yeah. Most people won't know what that. You want to? You want to talk about it? Explain let's pretend. Because a lot of people crazy. don't know. Yeah. Let's just be crazy for one second and, pre- and pretend I don't know what you're talking about, Father. Let's yeah. just just for the sake of the audience, you yeah. know, let's yeah. just go wild. Yeah. So this thing of um, kayfabe, you know baby face turning heel heel turning baby face this um basically in professional wrestling it's you know i don't know how the best word to describe it. it's like a narrative tool right it's it's to um number one garner and keep the attention of the audience through the manipulation of their emotions right and so what happens is you, you set up a story whether you have a black hat, white hat, good guy, bad guy, right? And then you um, use different means to really get people invested in that. And then, um, you know, at some point in time, the baby face, the good guy, you know, getting him to turn heel, turn bad guy, you know, it kind of like stokes the passions, it stokes, it stokes the excitement, and then people are invested in a whole nother level. You know, it's kind of like, um <clears throat> speaking of like you know tsd trump syndrome trump derangement syndrome whatever tds um it, it's the same thing that's where some people will say like it doesn't matter um whether someone's a liberal and they're like hate trump 24 7 or they're you know um super dark maga whatever love trump 24 7 as long as you're engaged in seeing the thing as black hat white hat they have your, your attention is is not where it should be, right? Well, they're you, both engaged with Trump twenty four seven, and the thing is, Trump just wants you engaged with him twenty four seven, right? Like, tr- if if you go, Trump is a Trump is a, a reality show producer, and it's like, look, whether you're watching The Apprentice because you hate Trump, or whether you're watching The Apprentice because you love Trump, the advertisers don't care, right? The network now, doesn't care. <laughs> now, now I would just say this because one of the problems that I want to avoid here is that one of the problems we're dealing with is, and this is what's fascinating about this phenomena kind of on the bigger scale is um, for the very people who need to be out of the spell, just even the name being brought up, it causes the noise. So, oh, we've already, we've already, right. they've, they're, they've already, we've already lost them. So they're already gone. So just so let's shift, not say his name anymore. Right. Let's not so, say his name anymore. So just to shift it, it can be, it's applied anywhere. It's applied anywhere, and it's it's applied in soap operas. I mean, it's applied um, everywhere, and there's that portion of it. But then the other side of it, these two things fit together is. 
you know, giving someone something which they're 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 yearning for spiritually. People don't articulate it that way. See, this is the thing that perhaps people miss out on or they don't understand this is that it's very few people are um Michael Moore, right? Um oh not Michael Moore, forgive me. Uh, I was gonna also, say this took a weird turn. <laughs> although <laughs> Michael Moore for sure, very few Michael Moore. Um the mage. Um oh uh Rob uh more more, but what what is it? Not Robert Moore? No. No. Why can I not remember? The Watchman right. guy, right? Yeah. Alan oh, Moore. Re- Alan, Alan Moore. Moore. Thank you. Yeah. Had to put it in comic books if we put yeah, it in comic Yeah, I know that's the only way I can. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Very few. I mean, yeah, the reality is, is very few people are, are Alan Moore. Like, very right. few people are Alan Moore. Um, But if this, you know, and again, Andrew may need to come in and, and do the thing for the people. That's kind of doesn't matter. <laughs> it, it doesn't mm-hmm. matter because you don't need every single creator to be Alan Moore. Alan Moore is a symbol for intentionality. Right. That's it. That's it. But you don't need every single creator of everything to be Alan Moore. Right. Well, because- Father, you, you know who the new Alan Moore is mm-hmm. that I think people could relate to? It's Jake Paul. Mm. He's such a sorcerer. I don't know who I, I was. Wa- I watched the Tyson thing, the Tyson Jake Paul fight wow. on Netflix. This is it this was is, the biggest K thing. Yeah, yeah, yes, it is. But I want to hear what Father's saying because I think I have something. But what were you saying? I'm so sorry, okay. Cyprian. One second, Father. What were you saying? Well, I was saying that everyone doesn't have to be Alan Moore because, in fact, the reality is is that the higher level is people are. And this is this is uncomfortable. This is an uncomfortable reality. But when the master says you either form you're against me, you know, the, the reality is, is that you're either moving in a certain orientation or you're not. And if you're not moving that orientation, this is why being friends with the world is enmity towards God. Because. See, when you create something. Just the act of creating something, right, putting something together in such a way that people now we're talking a couple minutes ago about engaging with something consumer, right. And producing and consuming all these things. Those are all just kind of terms that we can use for this, this type of engagement, spiritually speaking. Right. So this is why on some level, right. You know, uh, an idol is an idol. Right. And, and for those of a greater conscience, you know, it's nothing to them, as Paul says. But if causing my brother to stumble by me eating meat, I'll never eat meat again. And the reason for that is, is because that potential to be snagged by that thing is very real. So the story, the song, um, whatever that thing is that brings you that connection to life, spiritual life, sacramental life, right? Right. And especially if it's in the it's in the kind of anti space, in other words, in the place of. So reading comic books is totally fine and harmless until it's not. And the problem is, is most people can't discern when they've crossed that line. And the reason why they can't discern when they've crossed that line is because the very nature of the work itself is designed in such a way that you're not paying attention to it because it's there to pull you out of objective reality because it's it wants your attention, right? And it wants your attention for what purpose, for what end, you see? And so the thing is, is this engagement, this, this being vigilant, this being, you know, quote unquote, <laughs> in the world, but not of the world. It, these are one of those things where we hear it, we hear it, we hear it. But if you ask someone to take it seriously, it becomes very difficult. And it becomes very difficult not for them to not only understand what you're saying, but to even want to to try to apply it. Because what happens is our egos, our identities, our lives feel as if they're so enmeshed in the world that if I don't have my entertainment, whatever that is, food, sex, drugs, rock and roll, violence, whatever the thing is, if I don't have that thing, 
than what's left of me. And it gets even more nefarious in the sense of people wanting to master something. And this is where the kind of opinion of things comes into play. Because if I can put my, <clears throat> if I have a sense that, because I want to matter, you know, th- this is, this is why um, in, a, in a general sense, right? I, there's always exceptions, right? But in the general sense, we tend to not, we tend to be such an unsober people. When in comparison to speaking to your, you know, average Eastern European or your average whatever, because, you know, the luxury and all the things that we have being so just soaked in entertainment, it's caused us to be unsober. And so that being soaked into entertainment, that's why our politics looks like the way it does. Yeah. And yes. And I, I've wondered like how many of the um, radicalist, po- because I think the perspective I take is a lot of times is what people are really afraid of to a degree. And I'm going to be kind of careful about how I say this. Cause I'm not sure that I know exactly what I'm saying, but I think a lot of times what people are really afraid of is like their, um, them feeling nothing mm-hmm. it's like them feeling so they'll take anything to kind of take them out of that and more often than not because since we're like um a society that's been raised more or less on dopamine or often than not we mistake the largeness of an emotion with the validity of emotion mm-hmm. so like if i am so sure that my roommate pete or whoever uh is I don't know why I said Pete. I'll just pick a different name. My roommate, Troy, is taking money from me. I'm sitting at work all day just getting heated about it. And the more and more I this as emotion is getting bigger in me, the more and more I feel that it is valid. Now, so I get out of work and then Troy's texted me and said, hey, man, I already paid you back the money. I Venmoed you like 10 minutes ago. I'm so sorry. I didn't have my phone on me or whatever. So then the... The, it becomes in such a place where that large emotion that you're feeling, the deflation of that emotion can't happen. So there needs to be like a doubling down. So if a person finds themselves in extremist politics, that oftentimes those extremist politics kind of resemble like have like a theater or a dramatic feeling to them or like a quality to them. If that feeling is challenged and they start to deflate, like it can't happen. It's that's their life force. It's the life force of them to be able to keep that big feeling going because if they don't have that big feeling, they don't have the validity that they've been raised to like expect or like that they've been raised. Am I making sense? I don't know. Yeah, if I'm we, I mean, sense. let me, if I could, I would, I would add this. Yes. Um, Please make it a bit more succinct, Father. I mean, I, I, I just want to kind of, it may be a little bit of a divergence, but, you know, um, emotions are like angels. Emotions are like angels. Angels, angelos, messengers, right? And emotions are given to us for a purpose. And that purpose is to communicate. But when those messengers, when those emotions then want to take a life of their own outside of their purpose, they become fallen and they want to be worshiped, you see? So you can have holy messengers, anger was given to us, the fathers teach, to fight against sin and the demons. But when anger becomes the thing in itself, It's no longer an angel. It becomes a demon and it wants to be worshipped. And so when you begin to engage with the emotion of anger and it becomes larger than life, this is your, you're on your way to having a possession, right? Your passions. When anger takes over, I'm no longer looking at Giuseppe. I'm looking at the spirit of anger, right? Now, if you understand that, then what you can begin to understand is that's the high level of something in regards of it's micro, but that this is a weird chiasm that I'm about to bring up a chiasm is kind of crossing over. It's micro in the sense of the individual person 
but it still scales up. And once it scales up, that's how you get populations. And that population grab happens through PSYOP, through, and PSYOP is a lot bigger than what people want to talk about, right? No one wants to consider that WWE could be a PSYOP. <laughs> Although Linda McMahon, I mean, I'm just saying, right? These things are very interesting to me. But let me just stick to this th- this point here. The reality of being passive, enslaved to a movement, to your emotion, to where you cannot think. It's like I've said here before, may God grant John Paul paradise. It's like my dad taught me when he taught me how to box. Do not get angry. If you get angry, you're no longer boxing and the guys got you. That's why some of the best fighters, more than just their skill, It was the head game. They knew how to get into the head of the other person, get them angry and get them not boxing. And this is why the whole larger scale thing of kayfabe, right? And the manipulation of people through emotions is so brilliant because it works every time. There are certain mechanical movements in fighting that if you just do X, Y, and Z, it just almost works every time. It's, it's literal, it's literal mechanics. So it's the same thing in regards of spiritual warfare because spiritual warfare necessitates spiritual warfare is not the invisible things just kind of coming in. It's the whole person. We're Orthodox Christians. We're not Gnostics. Spiritual warfare absolutely also includes the manipulation of cortisol and dopamine and all those things that the devils Mm -hmm. use to hook people. So when you get a larger narrative of something that is not real, right? When you get a black hat and a white hat and you get someone who can say something one way and then just switch it up and say it a different way and people are moved like they have a fish hook, that tells you everything. And that happens on the lower level with people and their passions and their anger and their despondency and their envy. It happens on the larger level. And I would just add this other thing that I'll be quiet. One of the things to your point, Andrew, which is so poignant, so poignant that I fear, I genuinely fear most people do not know what you're talking about. And most people may not put the time into experience what you're talking about on the level they need to is this. When someone quote unquote begins to practice the Jesus prayer, Right. One of the things that they'll find or just prayer in general, let's just keep prayer in general. Just prayer in general is they find it so difficult and they begin to avoid it. They begin to avoid not so much the action of being in the prayer corner because they'll do that. And a lot of times their vanity will get them to do it. What they're avoiding is that stillness. They're avoiding that space of it's quiet, not just quiet, like I can't hear anything. But that quiet, like, this is uncomfortable. What is this? It's terrifying. And it's because he is the stillness. He is the quiet. And you're running from him. And so this is at the root of why, unfortunately, it feels difficult for people. But there have been times when certain statements have been said in an absolute sense of, You don't know Christ. You don't think, excuse me, you're not encountering Christ like you think you are. Because there are certain things that you're not even aware of are a litmus to that. And everything that you are so involved and invested in proves that you are not at that place of even understanding or experiencing that litmus. Because you're not even taking that moment to get into that space. Because the second half, the second someone comes in, begins to actually test you. The second you're, you're, you're called to actually begin to box, you can't do it because you're so caught up, right? And so your emotions, they got you all confused, all twisted, and you're just, you're, you're on the line, right? Meaning that 
you're just being moved and manipulated to whatever you need to be. And that is a real problem because not only on an individual level, but when you have the people of God, quote unquote, who are not doing the things that the people of God should do, not because they're necessarily opposed to it. I would never say to some, you know, if I say to someone, hey, you know, the things of the people, the things that people of God should be doing, you know, all the acts of mercy, like talked about here before at length, there really shouldn't be any um, nonprofits. Like, if you look back on the things we've talked about, they're all there for a reason. Every single major thing we've talked about, even in some of the small things, they're there for a reason. Why do we talk about nonprofits? Because the reason why there shouldn't be not any nonprofits, we shouldn't, I, I should not need to write an open letter to Donald Trump or to whoever fill in the blank. The people of God should already be doing those things because that's what brings the light of Christ into the world. And that's the way that you avoid the temptation from the quote unquote right. Let's just be clear. Someone has commented, people commented, I just want to make this really clear. Some people think that you you shouldn't conflate what the fathers talk about in regards to temptation from the left and the right with politics. And the problem is, is when someone says that, they don't understand where we are at. That's a false dichotomy. And that understanding of my religious life is over here, but my political life is over there, that's exactly the problem. My entertainment life is over here. My religious life is over here. That's exactly the problem. And so, for instance, what are we to do? Well, there we should put nonprofits out of business because the people of God should be doing all that work for the sake of Christ. And the Holy Spirit would guide us and provide for us and do all those things. But the problem is, is the people of God, right? Yes, I know there's individuals. And if you're taking umbrage because you do things, God bless you. Keep doing things, right? But everyone has to understand the Great Commission, the Master didn't say, go out, you know, and make disciples of individuals. <laughs> it's go make disciples of nations. Okay, so forgive me, right? I'm just, okay, forgive me. So, yes, the people of God, right? It's not that the Holy Spirit doesn't want these things. It's This is what the people of God should be doing because that is, it isn't just your love for one another. It's your love in general. And so the lack of love that we have is often, you know, kind of calcified because of, you know, the obsession with what's perceived perceived to be things like doctrinal purity, dogmatic purity. And all those things are important, but those things are important so that your works can be pure, not the other way around. And I just think that's so important because one of the things that people can be missing out on is like, you know, the harvest is nigh. <laughs> and so, for instance, um, you've heard this expression before, you know, about I'm going to butcher it. I got to butcher a lot of expressions. But essentially, you know, if we're doing well, then then God owes Sodom and Gomorrah an apology. Right. Um, I, I don't know why anyone would ever think that we are in a place of repentance as a nation. I don't know where someone would think that. Um I'll be very clear, forgive me, I'll be very clear with people. This is to help everyone, okay? Um, if you think that, you know, because we want repentance so that God would have mercy on us and, and grant us years and to bring harvest, all these things. But let's just, you know, I'm just saying, um, if you, let's say, are, you know, not doing a certain thing, but you're watching it, you're consuming it, right? You're not actively rejecting it, sodomy. Yes. You know how many, like, beyond just pornography, right? So much of the porn that's consumed by people is sodomy. I'm just being very, because people, you know, they don't understand. So I'm just trying to be explicit. So it isn't just that you're consuming porn. You're consuming porn that's, that's sodomy. And so as you just consume that and just say it's no big deal, whatever, and like, okay, you confess and, and you do these things. But at what point in time 
you know, you begin to kind of, you know, it begins to aggregate, you know, you begin to have all these numbers and just adding, right? It's the same thing with abortion, same thing with all these things, right? So I'm just saying people need to understand some things. Like, for instance, repentance. What does national repentance look like? We talked about that two years ago, I think. Right? I mean, we've talked about it repeatedly Re- for the repeatedly. last three years. We've talked about it in at least a dozen episodes. Yeah. And, and, and here's the thing. Um, people, I mean, before 20, I mean, this is something that I personally f- caught so much heat from, thanks be to God, about, but people just couldn't understand this concept about, you know, national repentance. Well, what do I like? And again, Christians, Orthodox. What? Do, why do I need to repent for what someone else has done? If you say that as an Orthodox Christian, that just goes to show and it's okay. I'm not punching down, right? <laughs> but if that, if you don't understand that, then that's okay. But you just need to know. I'm just telling you because you may not have someone in your life to tell you this. I'm telling you that you don't really understand orthodoxy, spirituality, Christ, the way that you think you do. Because for better or for worse, as a nation, quote unquote, we're connected and tied. And that's why the tragedy of the lack of authentic leadership on both sides (laughs) is so problematic. Because the reality is, is that that lack of authentic uh, leadership, right? It causes the the people who should be leading to not do so because they think everything is okay. If you understood what I'm just, what I just said, right? The real problem is when people who should be actually leading and teaching the people these things aren't doing so because they think lower level materialist things are are all that matters, then you have a problem. Without vision, the people perish. Not vision of how can we be great, not vision of how do we make certain groups of people pay for past injustices. That's not repentance, that's vengeance. So that's not what I'm talking about. But there is national repentance. It is possible, right? It is possible. But the question is, is who ushers us into that? It was Christ (laughs) at the end of the day. (laughs) That's right. As as a microcosm of of national... Oh, go ahead, Father. I'm sorry. Well, I was just going to say, that's right. And so the problem is, getting back to what I'm saying, uh, if we don't actually... If we're not engaging Christ the level that we need to, not the level that you want. If we're not engaging Christ to the point of the cross. See, this is the thing. This is what I've tried to communicate. We tried to communicate collectively. But I personally tried to communicate to people when I talked about the, you know, the Byzantine, the neo-Byzantine bros and like, or, you know, Orthodox America. They don't, when I say they don't understand, I, I literally mean with all charity they don't understand because, and here's how I know that none of these, none of these people who tend to communicate this idea of an Orthodox America, none of them talk about suffering. None of them talk about the cross. None of them talk about the real need for that in order for the people to enter into, right? You, (laughs) you can't, are you going to partake of the baptism in which I'm baptized? That was not that I've been having a dialogue with someone for years and years and years. And we've always been pretty when I was woke, they were still pretty MAGA. And then when I mm-hmm. repented of the woke, then I jumped right over them, straight over to Antichrist, you know, like, you know, kind of the end of the line. And the only line that I saw actually get through and they're a listener of the show, the only line I actually felt like actually brought about a little bit of conviction was they were like, well, do you honestly think it would have been better if Kamala had won? And I was like, I don't know, ask Russia when the communists took over. Like, mm-hmm. ask them. Ask them how orthodoxy did after that. People who before, like me, 
just couldn't be bothered some Saturday nights to go to Vespers are now taking bus to bus to That's bus right. and different groups of people to like walk in different directions to all converge on some tiny hut on the edge of the village and take a tiny little liturgy where you're not even can't even sing too loud. Read that's the cat right. read about the catacomb churches. Like that's the people who could not be bothered before. Suddenly we're going way out of the, and that was me too. We had sign up lists during the brief little time that we you know that we closed down. And it was it was like about coordinating, we had to make sure we we're there at the right time. This is all stuff I just couldn't be bothered to do before there's any kind of repression. And I could tell that one line kind of got through where they were like, Oh, I can't there's really like not a way I can really come back to that. Like I can't say anything to that because that's it's it's Christ. It baffles any kind of logic, but you know it's true. You know yeah, that and, like and, and forgive me, just to help people's cognitive dissonance, I'm not being snarky or facetious. I I, I mean it in, in a very literal sense. Um yeah. I'm not a masochist. <laughs> you know, I don't I don't want to uh be left in a room with nothing but starving rats and then have them, you know, be tied down to a table and have them eat my body. I don't want that. I don't want to watch my spiritual children and my children. I don't, you know, be um, systematically arrested. And like, I, I don't want those things personally either. But the difference is, you know, I still understand what Christ calls us to because I authentically and genuinely have respect for the martyrs not lip service right and when i say that i don't just mean the ancient ones you know i mean i've i've looked in the eyes of brothers older brothers and stuff serbian brothers who have suffered whose families have suffered um that's what i'm talking about and it's and it's it's wrong for us to assume that we would get something sweet and juicy, spiritually speaking, by just kind of like having the right hat on and having the right outrage, that's not the cross. And there's no Christian empire that has ever done it that way. There's others. There's others. The Catholic Church in Germany, that's what they did. They went, they went all in with Hitler. Right. We can we can think of others. Right. We can think of those who went in with the surgeonists like so that that's there. But I'm just saying that this problem is, is fundamentally a problem of a lack of discernment. And, you know, it's, uh, you know, this this kind of I love that phrase, epistemological warfare. Right. This break that I, down a little bit because you mentioned that in the chat, Father. What do you mean by that? People don't understand. They don't know, number one, the root of what things mean. Right? Epistemology is, you know, where do where do you where do you go for your source of truth? Right? Where do you how do you understand the source of truth? Right? Okay. Cyprian's the philosophy major. He maybe has a more succinct way of describing it, but this that's a, that's, knowing, a pretty, that's a pretty good way to describe it. Not knowing the source of truth, not knowing how to go there. But what's more tragic is if you supposedly know how to go there, but you refuse to go there because you have other idols in front of you, ideology, right? There was this great comment in the last show, um, and I just I I just applaud people like this guy, whoever he is. I can't I don't know his name, but. He was just so honest. He's like, yeah, this is a real struggle for me to hear all this. But I realized that um, it's tough for us because we we have our ideology. We cannot put our ideology above our spirituality. I was like, bingo. That mm -hmm. that's that's literally, at least on this end, that's literally what's being talked about. But just approach from as many different sides as possible. Is that, you know, and again, shout out, right? But you know, ideology, ego, power. I, I love that. That's brilliant. These are the things that tempt people, that keep them from actually, you know, going all the way with something. And so when your ideology gets in the way, 
when your ego gets in the way, when your desire, for, you know, which power falls into that, you know, um, none of those things not only will lead you to Christ, but they're directly opposed to Christ. And so this is this is another thing where it's just fascinating to me, but people, again, they, they really think that Antichrist, not even the Antichrist, right? We can talk all about that with, you know, <laughs> supercomputers and Elon and everything, but, um, but Antichrist, just in the spirit, in the general sense, it's like, Guys, the Antichrist, if you want to know how to discern that, you have to know where you are um, easily tempted. You, ha you have to know your weaknesses, right? You have to know where, where you would sell, the, sell, sell out the cross, right? And this is, you know, we said this, this is another thing from years ago. You got to know your line, not when, not when you're at the line, you have like, I would like to think one of the major things about this project has been trying to get people to understand, do your work. You know, this is one of the things I was trying to get out. We're talking about Alan Moore and things like that and shows and it's like, just, you can't be lazy. I, I know that really hurts people's feelings. I'm sorry, genuinely, but you know, uh, you can't be lazy because that laziness, that's how they, the principalities and powers, and then those who serve them, because it's both, that's how they got you. Is they they're banking on you being lazy and not being willing to find out what things mean and where that source of understanding came from. That's that epistemological warfare. Right? When you found out about Orthodox Christianity and you decided to chase that rabbit down you were engaging properly to whatever degree you're able to, you're engaging properly in that warfare because you began to throw off certain presuppositions, certain conditionings that you'd had for generations. But the problem is, is, and if you've never had a priest tell you this, it's okay, I am telling you now. When you enter into the church, you did not cross the finish line. You're at the beginning. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. Well, if like, uh, that was, that was something I want to say something about entering the, the church that father, you mentioned a long time ago, Probably like 45 minutes ago or so ago about losing your taste for entertainment. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the things that um, happened to me. And I remember reading a book series at the time. And uh, it was a fantasy book series. I think it's The Wheel of Time, actually. And for the first time, I'd been made a catechumen for the first time. I was like, I don't desire to live in that world like the fantasy world, I'd always had like a fantasy of like, okay, how cool would it be to be able to live in any other reality except for this one? Because I remember, and I was like, well, why is that? And I remember thinking like, because Christ isn't there. And I remember thinking like for the first, that was a revolutionary thought because I, that's how I dealt with stuff for a long time was escaping. It was like escaping into other worlds as best as I could and vibing substances and playing video games and pretty much pretending I'm yep. living in that world yep. and how ingrained yep. to what you were just saying, father, how ingrained that spirit was in me without realizing it, that not only did I not necessarily recognize at the forefront of my brain that I was really trying to escape this reality, but also like then the, the shedding of wait, no, I don't want that because in that world, there is no Christ. Like living in that set of rules and that set of magic with those creatures, there is no Christ there. And that and it's better to be here. And like right away, that's like um, you know, it's kinda like, okay, if I want to continue that, it's very much like Christ being like, Do you want to be healed? Mm -hmm. Do you want to be healed? Do you want to be out of your delusion? And I think that's what I wanted to ask. This is all my long winded way of asking. Why do you think it's so hard for people to put their ideology below 
their religious life or or at least like you know marry the two so that recognize that they're the same thing i know you mentioned ego power and pride but like why do you think that like it's so difficult for joe schmo to just be like okay well maybe there's a power that transcends like the u.s government like maybe there is a higher game here that's being played why is that so difficult for people to like grasp well i think it's multiple things i think the first one level of it's just difficult because you know um you know jimmy he wants he looks at his little girl he wants her to have a house and a car um, he wants her to, you know, go to her first dance. I, none of those things are bad. And the problem is, is you you say these things, then you know, again, the emotional, th- those, those demons, both yes, literal, but also going back to my reference of emotions, they kick in, and they start saying no, 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 because if you begin to look at these things soberly, what happens is you can no longer feed them. You can't give them the attention, and so all kinds of things kick up and it's like, well, no, I don't, you know, I remember talking with people. um, It is what it is, but uh, you know, people back in the evangelical days, I've heard this so many times, you know, confidentially, you know, again, you know, I'm not breaking any confidence with anyone in this sense, but they would say, you know, Hey, I just, I really hope the rapture doesn't happen until I get married. I hope the rapture doesn't happen until like no no really you'd be surprised how I mean how many evangelicals I knew men and you know some women thought this way I don't want the rapture to happen because I haven't had sex yet but I'm being really Ooh. no don't be surprised don't I, be, am, I, I think I think if we're I think if we're honest with ourselves almost everybody if they really are well either. If if that seems something like something foreign that's not that you have never thought, then either one, you don't actually believe the rapture, or two, you're not being honest with yourself. Yeah, yeah. And so just because for... because you love people, right. you I, like I think about I think about the things to come, and I think about the end times. I have two young daughters. I love. I mean, I lo- I love them. I love my wife. You know, and it's and. You know, the, and, but my wife is Russian, right? So it's like the reality of what it means to be a martyr is in the DNA of my family. Mm-hmm. A real martyr, a real shot martyr. in the head martyr right. for Christ is in the DNA of my family in modern times, not some far flung time in modern times. And so it's like, yeah, I. Yes, yes, I do understand that like that is the crown. But like the 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 to wrestle with of course, I I love how how could I leave my children alone? Right. Or that my children would be martyred. Right. It's terrible. <laughs> because entire families were martyred. It's terrible. I mean, think about there's a great movie if anyone wants to see it's on YouTube whatever. That should be The Life of St. Luke of Crimea. You know, I mean, what he leaving his family to, to to serve the church. I mean, over and over again. And I would say this: one of the problems is this is a core problem, right? Um, there are people who cannot even begin to think this way, and so because they can't begin to think this way, they just want to shut it down. I don't want to hear it, and it's just whatever the reason would be at home and all these, all these attacks, but, the, but fundamentally it boils down to like, just even being pushed to that place to even consider it is just difficult for people. But it, you know, if you're, if again, if you're going to be serious, you have to really consider it because everything else is just false. Right. So I think, I think that's one of the reasons, Andrew, I think another reason for people is you know, they, they, um, and again, completely charitable, you know, people will become, people will do, th- the thing of the passions is you become passive to them, right? So the thing about passions, they become these habitual enmeshed aspects of sin in your life and, and ultimately your personality. So what happens is people will begin to act out of their passions. And they don't even realize they're doing it people becoming manipulative, people becoming deceptive, envious, angry, 
all of these things. They don't even realize that they're doing it. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. You if see? I may, Father, on on that note, last week I think it's I think it will be pertinent to the audience. I think mm-hmm. last week I uh, deleted. You know, I had talked about removing the history from my YouTube, whatever. Last week, I deleted the YouTube app from my phone. And this is that's like sort of my final thing of social media, right? And the same pattern that I had noticed when first I went off Facebook, then I went off Twitter, but like I noticed it again, and it goes to write this father forgive them, they know not what they like. That being literal. And it's interesting because what I found myself over the last week was I made note of all the times that I mindlessly opened up my phone and went to the app looking for the app. And then I was like, and because the app was not there, it triggered in me. And I was like, wow, how many times a day was I doing this? Mm -hmm. And I had no idea that I was doing it until I took the app off my phone. And it's interesting because in one of my private groups, you know, somebody had been like, oh, I'm having these problems with YouTube. And one person had been like, oh, yeah, Cyprian said he re- he took off the history. So the algorithm didn't get him. And I said, oh, actually, I, I deleted the a few days ago. I deleted the app from my phone and someone right underneath an orthodox person, mind you, was like, wow, when I read that, I had a pang of anxiety. Mm-hmm. And I know what that is now. Mm-hmm. And I was like. And I, but I found that so interesting that just you think about all of these things. And so for me, this is where I'm constantly reminded of how Christ has changed me. And like, what? Because somebody wouldn't be like, oh, remove the YouTube app from my phone. It's like, yo, did you have a pang of anxiety when I said that? Did you have a pang of anxiety when I said that? Well, <laughs> well, <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And it's like, I've had the most productive week. Yeah, I've had the mo- the most wonderful and productive week. Yeah. So I don't even know what was being fed into me in all of those mindless moments. I was just open for programming at that point. I would know? just say I would offer this for people to consider. One of the things um, about our project that has been, I think, very insightful for people is, wow, these guys, they talk about things that I can relate to that I understand You know, everything from, you know, pop culture, essentially, these are things. But it's like, yeah, the thing to always remember, though, is that um, trying to be of service in the sense of talking about these things, but talking about them kind of like from the other side of it. Does that make sense? And so I think that one of the things that we can begin to not really um, be honest about is that the struggles that we have as Christians, right? Um, that really we are all being called to whatever degree by the Holy Spirit to pick up a cross in ways that are hidden, which are oftentimes the harder cross. And I want to say this because um, there's so much in regards of, you know, uh, having to speak polemically and things like that because of the nature, you know, it's a show, broad audience, you know, blah, blah, blah. And just, and even in conversations when there's more than just one person, you tend to speak in these terms, right? Because you only get very specific and particular about things when it's private and intimate. Right. And so that, I think a little side note, I think that's, what's been interesting about this project too, is that we're able to get kind of intimate in the sense because of the way that God kind of brought the format together and able to do it in a way that's still public enough to be digestible. Now, that being said, the reality is, is that um, for all the talk about the bigger scale things, let's just be clear. This is something that I've been trying to get across is that ultimately you can't do anything about those things in so far as, you're able to do those things behind closed doors that you need to do. Does that make sense? How I'm saying that, Mm. you know, I, I don't really think that anyone has any right to really say anything about any large scale thing. Like for instance, are you saying clean your room clean? Yeah. Yeah. 
clean your room. <laughs> it's very interesting. I have no problem, you know, <laughs> giving the source, you know. So yeah, clean yeah. your room. I love it. I love it. Oh, the the early insights, he had very few of them, but they were very good yeah. and very poignant. It's hey, just when he got out over his skis. Check out that clock. clock. That clock is mm -hmm. broken, but it's still right a couple times a day. Twice I mean, day. that clock right there. That's it. That's oh, it. he so. was no, he 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 was he was very right until he got out over his skis. Like that's it. He yeah. was super right. So long as he stayed in his domain, you when can, he got out over his skis, then you can almost see the fragmentation of a soul that won't accept repentance. Like you can, like he even looked healthier back in the day. I mean, timestamp man, you know, mm -hmm. like here you go. Like we're ragging on. It's been a little while. Let's bring out the hits for just one minute. But I mean, even like I'm not even trying to go after his appearance. But with discernment, with time spent in the church, you can kind of tell when people aren't doing well spiritually from their physical features. Like, not it's it's not. Can, I'm. It's can not I, like. Can I bring something up though to your point? Um, Cyprian shared that clip, which I mean, that clip with him and Elon to me. It was one of those ones where it, it's just, it's so telling on so many levels. Um, but to your point specifically, I think one of the things is that, and this is, this is a tough one, right? But, you know, speaking about people don't even realize sometimes their passions are acting, Right. But when you watch him and he responds to Elon making that comment, I don't know if we should even play it, but he makes that comment and you can, I can, I mean, I was just, you can kind of feel the, like the stutter there, you know, like, uh, I hope you're, you know, you know, not as serious as you're saying, but no, he says, I wish he knows he's serious. And he says, I wish that was funny. Yes. And then you. Elon starts cracking yeah. up. Yeah. Thank you. And so mm -hmm. the reason why I'm saying this to, to your point, Andrew, is that if you do that over and over again for your living in regards of like ob observing essentially evil, examining evil, and then participating in it to a certain degree, that's going to have an effect on you. And I know this is hard for people to say. And again, part of the problem is, is that I understand that Jordan Peterson was a part of a lot of people's journey, and I don't begrudge that. But you know what? One of the things that's been very interesting, I think, about this project, too, is, you know, um, there's been all kinds of things that have been part of my journey. And I'm not defending those things. <laughs> You know what I mean? Quite I just, the contrary. It, it quite the contrary, you know. But it's it's still what it it's still what it is. It's like I don't. I thank God for all of the difficult things, um, and I, I I'm grateful, and that's why I worship Him. Is that in spite of my sin, He first loved me, and He's able. Only He is able to take my sin and use it to save me. Only he's able to do that. And so that's why, you know, getting, again, another concept to people, right? When you begin to wake up and you give thanks for 20, you're, you're on the right trajectory, right? But don't undo that work. <laughs> don't, don't undo that work, right? So, but, but that thing is, um, to that point, I think that's a big part of what I see there because, you know, there's, there's this weird space of just kind of like dancing on the edge of the fire and just slowly getting blistered and burned and, and what that does versus just go in and be consumed, you know? And, and I think that's a large part of what's happening. And I don't think anyone's going to disagree with that, right? Everyone's right. Hoping for the best. I hope for the best. I hope that he genuinely has a time of, of, of not playing games, but actually, going into the light Christ, you know, not Caroline um, and, <laughs> you know, being, being consumed. 
But the thing is, is like he said in so many of his famous T-Ride moments, you know, it's terrifying. Not because everything that he's built, and I don't just mean the externals of, of a multi-million dollar persona, his inner life is what I'm talking about. Everything that he's built, it would crumble. And forgive me, I just want to highlight something for people there. When I said that, most people, I feel comfortable saying that, thought that I was talking about his multi-million dollar persona. And I wasn't talking about that at all. That that's a, I'm just trying to give a little kind of another little, hey, look, this is kind of what we're talking about. How are you thinking about things? Father, are you talking about Peterson or Trump right now? I, I lost the thread. It could be both, but okay, also, sure, essentially Peterson. Fine. Essentially Peterson. Yeah. Okay. I was talking about Peterson the whole there, time. There, there was a time. So as somebody who lived off his brand, right? Like that was it. I mean, it was just this, the Vin Armani brand was, my, was how I made my living. There was a time when my brother, my youngest brother, he, he came to work with me in Vegas and he asked me, and this is directly to the point of what you're saying, Father, is he, he said to me, I remember distinctly, he was like, how much are you worth? I was like, I, you know, gave him a kind of a, a rough number or whatever, or whatever it was. And then I told him, but, you know, like, it's not really, that's not really a big deal because I'm sure that if it was all taken from me right now, I could get it back. But what I was talking about, about getting it back was I was, I was because my, because of the internal life that I had built, the mechanism that was there and how I knew the route, the route to power, right. And the route to like, uh, uh, worldly things was all there. Yeah. Right. But when I came to orthodoxy and in honesty, like, and again, like, I'm going to say this and I, I know people can't, there's no way that people could possibly understand this, like what, what this means. But like, I was on the middle of it. I, I'm in the middle of the ocean on an island surrounded by people who are not of my culture, right? Away from, there's zero software companies here and I'm a software developer. Right. And what I have had or what I did have to a certain degree, what I knew was I knew my brand. Like I, I knew that it was strong. I knew the thing that I could do. And it's incredible. Like Christ demanded one of the demands was that I had to shed that brand. And in some ways that were like, <laughs> there has been no benefit to me in a worldly sense of shedding that brand. I mean, even father, you know, when you called me and you were like, yep, that book that you wrote, which by the way, most people have written zero books. I've written three, but that was my first. Mm -hmm. And to have my spiritual father, who was newly my spiritual father, I think it was a matter of months. Yeah. Right. Who I had only even interacted with in person. This as a man, I'd only interacted with him in person for a week. Call me up and be like, Hey, that thing that you wrote, that was your first book. You have to take it out of print. You, nobody else can ever read it again. Who's halfway around the world. Mm -hmm. Who, if I decided to, I don't have, I could be like, hey, screw you, dude. Mm -hmm. Right? Like of the things to be, like, I, I don't know. Most people have never written a book. The people who have will be like, I'm pretty attached to the, yep. that's pretty attached to my identity and my ego that I wrote yep. and published. Not only that, but the reviews on the book are all positive. This changed my life. This is so good. Mm. Friends of mine have been like, I went back and read it years later. And oh, man, now I finally, this is a bro. This is a masterpiece. Right. But to basically have Christ call you and be like, hey, <laughs> mm -hmm. that's got to go. That's got to go. Was, and that, go ahead. Sure. You're in the middle of a thought, Cyprian. Go ahead. No, what I'm what I'm saying is that th this is hey, to me. By the I way, exact. Do you okay. hear that? Did you hear that, everyone? I just want to set the record straight. That's yeah. what we call in the industry a lag. So Cyprian has a lag. So sometimes Cyprian says stuff. Wait, I'd like we start talking at the same time, and then Cyprian. We don't need, to, to, we don't need to. We don't need no, to. I just want to. It's. it's I know. I just want to call attention to it for just one second. I'm just saying that, like, that's not intentional. Like, I just want to set the record straight because I feel like that that's something that was kind of like, if anything, ah, anyway, whatever. It's it doesn't demons. matter. It's whatever. demons. It's demons. The demons already knew there's a lag. 
the demons already knew there's a lag, right? Don't worry about that, right? See, now we just went off. Now we just went off. What I'm saying, that's what the demons they. wanted. That's what the demons wanted. They wanted us to justify and rationalize. So we're not going to do that. But do you know right? what I that's, want? That's that's what they want. Go ahead. You know what I want? Yes. I don't remember what I was going to say, but I will say this, that that was one of the things that Maggie, uh, my wife, she actually struggled with pretty hard when I first acquired a spiritual father was like back when I became a catechumen in the church that I ended up getting baptized in was my first spiritual father started making some pretty, you know, demands. Like there was really no way of me being able to um, like live on my own. And I was living with um, my then girlfriend, now wife's family. And basically he was like, yeah, you have to find a way to make this situation pleasing to God. Like, and this is what you have to do. And it takes some pretty extreme steps and God bless my wife that she ended up ever becoming Orthodox in the first place because I handled it with zero grace. But I basically was like, yeah, I'm going to start doing this stuff now. And she's like, well, who is this guy to come in, this old man I've only met like once or twice, and actually say like, no, you have to make very, very big changes to your life. And I think that that is like, it's something that, you know, in obedience, having to like really put aside that part of yourself I think it's one of the first things of like, well, how much are you willing to shed? And if you're not willing to shed, then there's nothing I can really do with you. But that that shedding, that ability to let something go and to change it, I never faced it on the same level that Cyprian did. But it was something that definitely is like the first thing I see lots of people butt up against. And it's, you know, it's the, what's the parable, Father? It's the wine press, right? To see what kind of juice is going to come out. Would that be... Am I accurate? Am I way off base about what kind that? Of juice is coming out. I don't know about juice coming out. What do you, uh... The wine press out of the grapes, right? Because, like, I don't know about mine, but like when I was pressed, it was some pretty stinky juice that came out at first. It was a lot of throwing fits, well, and like that's not a parable, but I like it in regards. To how we can. Oh, this <laughs> no, this is videos. not this is not a thing. Oh, well, it was like yeah. I don't know what I'm talking about then. But anyway, yeah, Father James, the baptizing priest, always said you need to knead the the air out of the bread before you can make, you know, before you can make communion bread. Yeah. You have to knead all that air out, and then a lot of times we have stinky air inside of us. So when we get pressed well, just, out, that stink. Just to fin- just to just so I can finish my thought, and then I'll be quiet. Um, yeah, I've been I've been wanting I, you to finish I, your thought. I think what what, and and this you know just what I wanted to communicate in in regards of the it's not shedding right i would have been very thankful for the mercy if i could have just shed a few things um but sometimes it's going to sometimes it absolutely requires the complete annihilation of the most valuable aspects of your identity things that you have built things that have sustained you things that represent your that represent all you know in terms of how to even provide for your children right sometimes christ is going to call you to christ is going to call you to obliterate all of those things but the one thing that i can say is that my obedience in that my obedience in that regard the mercy that he has shown has been what i can only describe as supernatural and miraculous i can only describe it as that and it it deepened my faith in a, in a great way. And so I think it seems that right now a struggle that many people have is that they have adopted things that are part of their identity and Christ is calling them not to shed them. They're willing to shed things, stop watching porn, go find another place to live. Maybe don't hang out with this set of friends. They're willing to shed, but Christ is calling them right now to obliterate things that, that are that they're that they hold dear very dear and things that they see as being that 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 they have a feel a sense of dread about i will die and how will my children live or if i abandon that this. even more than that in regards of more insidious and this and deceptive is this idea that no i can offer this to god that's even worse. Well, so, I was the mercy for me was that I didn't have that. So, I couldn't offer what I had to God. Right. Saul was removed, right? 
And so the thing is, is like this idea, no, no, you must destroy everything. You must destroy everything. No, no, no. We're, uh, there was this gold. There was these cattle. There's this that. We're going to offer, offer it to the Lord. No, there are times when it, he calls for everything because that little baby giant <laughs> will eventually become a big one. And this is, this is hard for people to hear. This is hard for people to hear. And, you know, just to make it, find it in your individual life. You don't need to look out and find it on the, the, the political theater, using that term very intentionally. Just look in your own life and understand that not only are you resisting because you may have this feeling that there'll be nothing left, but God forbid you think that you're going to be offering, you're going to be able to offer that to God. No, no, no. You just give everything. And then whatever is given back to you, you know, it's given back to you in the sense of that will be eternal, but only if you turn it all over. You see, the devil, he likes contracts and he likes little, you know, nuances and things like that, you know. But the Lord's very clear about what he wants. He wants everything. So, hmm. All right. Well, so speaking of that, not really, but I can't think of a good segue. We're coming up on probably 20 minutes to two hours. And um, we're just going to go and say that uh, we kind of been talking about this last week. Um, and I think that that's a good place to leave out on a little bit, but I think we've been talking about this last week that I think we're going to go ahead and at least for the fast and per foreseeable future, we're probably going to stop recording new episodes for a little while. Um, there was, uh, there was, yeah, it just got to the point where we don't know what more can be said. We've laid it out. Um, more father and Cyprian have laid it out and, this message of, and they've all said it, we've tried to cover every angle as best as we can on the central message of what the whole project was about. And we feel like that that's accomplished. Um, so we're not certainly, in Father's words from before the recording, we're certainly not shutting, we're shutting the door on it for a little while, but we're not locking it. I mean, the it's possible, I don't know, but like for the foreseeable future, we're probably at least definitely for the fast, we're probably not going to record anything new. There's nothing more to really be said right now. Um, and some of the comments that we got last week, while not like necessarily, we're not stepping back because of those comments, but what Father and Cyprian saw was a reaction from certain members of the audience or maybe they're not the audience, maybe they're just passing through or whoever, but it might have actually ended up hurting them a little bit. Um, this kind of doubling down this, you know, so. Let's just be clear. Forgive me, Andrew. I just want to, because I, I think please. this is going to give you the wrong. There's a term called choice to vote. I've talked about it before. Just want to be clear with people about certain things. Um, so choice to vote is the kind of preserving people from yourself. And it shouldn't all, shouldn't just be understood in regards of your kind of destructive potential, but also to the reality of not not heaping condemnation onto people. So, take for instance, you know, it's the one time I'm going to talk about it in this sense, which is kind of appropriate because I have a policy generally not talking about these things. But um, you can go and you can try to. Google it if you'd like. I would advise against it. But, you know, just consider something. If you're baptized in the church, one of the reasons why you need to be careful and the things about the priest guarding the chalice, it's not necessarily guarding Christ from you. It's guarding you from Christ. Consider that. And so in that same spirit, this is what I mean by choice well and seeing that, when you have a sleepwalker, you know, this 
I don't know if it's an urban myth or how they describe it, but this idea about a, be careful not to wake a sleepwalker because you might do them damage. So I would just say this, awaken, O oh sleeper. Yeah. Cyprian, you got anything to want to add up? I don't know. I don't know what more I could say. <laughs> well, I one thing that I will uh, actually say um, about the comments is, um, and I don't know the and Father, you can help me of wh who is the appropriate. Of course, thank God, but in in a way, uh, I'm quite. There's one commenter in particular who I, who. Ironically, and not ironically enough, it's providentially enough. I think their nickname, their uh, name was something like Michael Archangel or something like that, Michael Archangelo or something. And they, their avatar was like a little someone wearing a chicken head, but they were standing in front of some angel wings. And it was interesting that I believe I read it on the the day when the synaxis of the. Um, Archangels oh, was. Yeah. I believe it coincided, right? So it was very interesting that I was, you know, asking for intercessions that very day from Michael, who we have an icon of here. But um, you know, this person had said something like, Yeah, listening to this, I really, you know, it made me not want to be engaged on YouTube with online orthodoxy anymore. And I responded to them and I was like, you know, that's probably like great if you stop watching YouTube. Like that would probably maybe that's a because for me myself, I was like, wow, uh, would it, what a mercy it would be for me to be driven to that point. Like I was with Twitter where I had no choice but to be like, I'm done with this. Right. Like, I really feel like that was a real mercy that God gave me because other, and then it was like, I'm, I'm off and I don't want to be back on. And it was sort of an engagement with this person who I know thinks that I was being absolutely cynical. But like at the end of that engagement, I said, I'm deleting. Thank you. I'm deleting my YouTube, which I did. And so like, I really want to, I actually really want to thank that person. Like honestly, um, <laughs> in an honest and authentic way. And so like, maybe I, and, and, and I don't know, but, but anyway, like, I don't I, I don't know if maybe that was Michael presenting it in the way that I needed it to be presented in, right? In order in order for to further my salvation. But whatever it was, I'm it doesn't I'm matter, does it? It. <laughs> it doesn't. It doesn't. Yeah. It doesn't. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, just and and that's the thing. Like, I think just to put in case there are people who feel a need to be like, um, Oh, now I don't have this show because it's because of these commenters and you guys suck that you would. It's not that mm, it's no. quite the no, contrary, no, no, no. quite the contrary. And so I just wanted to put that out there just in a real down to earth way. I mean, you know, just like if I grass could, tax. If Go I ahead. could remind everyone. Just interestingly enough, remember the episode before I had my accident. And that episode was all about, you know, we cannot be the thing. No. Right. That, yeah. was, that was a big, that was kind of like the ending point on that, you know, and then I had that accident, which I'm super grateful for. But um, yeah, that's it. Well, thank God. I. It was, I'm really... I'm really thankful that I got to be a part of this. I thought it was really cool. It was a really big part of my life for a while. Um, I'm not going to know what to do with my Monday nights anymore. I'll, I'll figure something out. But also, you know, being having to engage in a way with my spiritual father and like a brother for two hours every week has been enormously beneficial. And if oh, there's geez. a if there's a sense of loss here. Just know I feel it too. Like it's not, this is not ideal, but I'm willing at least in a part to, to say goodbye to it. I mean, if at the end of the day, if I knew that this is, that God doesn't want this being made anymore, then no problem. We're done. Like that's, that's, that's where it needs to be. So it's kind of regardless of how I feel or sentimentality, 
it's like if it's if it's the end of the show then it's the end of the show i'm not saying that it is we don't really know but as of right now we're we're kind of taking we're taking a good hard break for a little while um you can feel still feel free to reach out i don't think those emails are going anywhere um feel free to reach out to us you know i'd be more than happy and for those of um yeah i mean i just want to yeah. say to forgive me um feel i think those who know know please um i respond to everything i get so feel free to to reach out and um you know i love god's people so yeah okay well for the last time if you guys want to reach out to us please contact at royalpath.network or uh, if you want to reach out to me individually some people still like to do that that's Andrew at royalpath.network. We'll have a merch store up for a while, the royalpath.store. Um, and then please check out uh, Mount Tabor. It's a school affiliated with St. Mary's, our parish here in Kansas City. And there's Scola Coffee. It's really good stuff. And please keep um, your eye on the convent. The convent's going to have some really good stuff. Yes. Up, uh, in the new year, in the next couple months, uh, new icons, acathists being put out um ongoing uh, material blogs things like that and i'll definitely be um kind of be i'll be chiming in here and there uh in regards of so the convent is going to be one of those places to kind of just kind of to see where things are, are what, what i'm up to um and also to you know posting the homilies and such and so um yeah we'll see what god so has. stay subscribed Stay, Stay subscribed. subscribed. Don't Stay unsubscribe. Subscribe. It's not the it's not the end of things coming to you through that subscription. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then we'll leave the playlists up on Apple Music and Spotify, the Royal Path Podcast playlist. But other than uh, Jack, what can be said? Jack, you are great. Great. Fourth member of the show. Incredible. Absolutely incredible. Um and, you know, thank you for all the people who commented. Thank you for the people who've been with us since day one, uh, especially the people that, you know, I shouted out last week and he was very kind about it, but especially people like Focus who, um, you know, struggle with some of the stuff that we said and stuck through and all the, all the people from last week. Those are the comments that you don't, you know, I'm still fleshly, so I'm not crazy about the criticism. I understand it's very good for me. And I'm definitely trying to avoid the praise, but that right in the middle of you guys are wrong, except that I kind of know that you're right. And it's not even that like we're right, but like you're pointing out something I don't want to see. Those were the really, that's like that sweet spot in the middle of being like, you guys are really, really starting to ruffle my feathers a little bit, but I'm telling you, you're ruffling my feathers. And I'm realizing that maybe this is a reflection of my spiritual condition. I'm like, yeah, those are my favorites. So to all those and thank you for everyone who said all the kind stuff over the you know three years or whatever that we did this um all the people who have sent very encouraging emails for all the people we helped you know you know that's awesome uh glory to god so it's my slava tomorrow so this is a whole like just being grateful being grateful that this happened at the same time you know it's very real for me anyway that the sense of loss will be absolutely it will be in my life without a doubt like i'm not even trying to shy away and act like it's not a big deal. Like, no, I was, you know, Royal path is a thing for me. So still feel free to reach out. And for the last time, thank you very much for having a good night. Bye-bye.